Welcome to the online course on Mindfully Facing Climate Change. This is the first of four parts, four topics. And each of these topics leads up to a meditation practice. In fact, this is probably the most central part in all that I'm presenting here, an actual meditation practice. Because I think for all of us, the challenge of climate change is something that calls for some practical response. And my belief is that in line with the basic thrust of Buddhist teachings, this practical response has to start in our own mind, in the cultivation of meditation. And so every one of these four lectures, there'll be a video, there'll be a audio, guided meditation instruction. And for those of you who like more details, there's also a chapter in my book, which has all the footnotes and bibliography, all the details. The basic suggestion would be to take this as a four week course in the sense of finding some time during the weekend to listen to this video, or if you like to read the book, and then during the week to do the actual practices. And the practice I present is a, it's a compact thing. It becomes one continuous meditation, but I've taken pieces out from other meditation practices that are more complete. And so my suggestion would be in the hope that you'll find the practice I present here useful that maybe when you have time for a longer retreat during the year, most of us find some time a week, a month, six weeks to go for the complete practices, which is the four Satipatthanas, the 16 steps of mindfulness of breathing and the four Brahma Viharas. I think if we are able to put these complete practices in a retreat period, that will further strengthen the daily practice of what I'm presenting here. The basic approach that I have adopted here in my wish to stay as close as I can to the early Buddhist teachings is based on adopting the Four Noble Truths. So each of these four topics will correspond to one of these Four Noble Truths. And these follow the following pattern. So as you can see from the terminology adopted here, there's a parallelism to medical diagnosis. The first truth is the diagnosis. The second one is the etiology. The third, the prognosis. And the fourth is the treatment plan. And so each of my four lectures or four presentations will be relating or taking one of these four truths as their starting point. This lecture is the first. It takes up the diagnosis, the diagnosis of Dukkha. The term Dukkha is often translated as suffering, but I actually think this is a bit misleading. Uh, I think it is better to keep just the Pali term, which at times may just mean that something is unsatisfactory. And for the first truth of Dukkha, I rely on a discourse taught by Venerable Sariputta, the discourse on the elephant's footprint. And this is one of three passages that relate to meditation, meditation practices related to the earth element that I'll be taking up in this lecture. So let us look at the first paragraph of this discourse on the elephant's footprint. This is the introductory simile. And here I have a little image for you. Now 
is quite simple and obvious. The elephant has such a large size of foot that all other footprints fit into that elephant's footprint. And then the discourse draws it out in the following way. The abbreviation at the end is just meant for those of you who like to follow up to read the full discourse. MN28 means middle long discourses, Majimanikaya 28. So what this passage tells us is that the Four Noble Truth have like a comprehensive function. Four Noble Truth is actually what the Buddha, the first teaching given by the Buddha, in which he summarized his own discovery, his realization. And so the Four Noble Truth has since then in tradition been always a central reference point. And this is why I have decided to take it as the basic scaffolding of this course, as the basic reference point. And the discourse on the elephant footprint then proceeds by a form of analysis from the Four Truth to the First Truth, the First Truth down to the Five Aggregates, the Five Aggregates down to the First Aggregate of Bodily Form, and then we come to the earth element. Bodily form is made up of four elements, earth, water, fire and wind, which stand for solidity, liquidity cohesion, temperature and motion. And the earth element is as follows. So the first passage here, we get this basic distinction between the internal and the external element. Now let us look at what this internal earth element is. So we get here this whole list of bodily parts. In order to understand this, the purpose of this listing, it is good to look at another passage. This is a passage found in the Ambuddha Nikaya where we get the description of a tree. And the tree is said to be having all of these four elements, earth, water, fire and wind. That, of course, means that even though when we see a tree, at first we see it as solid. But if we think of it, it actually has some liquidity, some fluids are in there. It has a certain temperature and there's also motion going on in there. So what this means is that in early Buddhism, and this may differ from later tradition, in early Buddhism, these four elements are qualities. Qualities that can combine in different degrees. So when the discourse on the elephant footprints gives us this list of solid bodily parts, it is not saying this is only earth and nothing else. It is only saying, look, these parts are predominantly earth. They're predominantly solid. But there's also some water element, some temperature, earth, fire element, and some motion going on in these solid parts. From this description of the internal earth element, which is in our subjective experience, the part, the place where we start, which is directly tangible. The discourse moves on to the external earth element.
This passage is based on an ancient Indian belief according to which the earth gets destroyed at regular times and one of these destructions can be called by, caused by the water element. Other possible destructions are the earth and the wind element. And so here we have the idea of a complete inundation. The earth is completely flooded. And this is meant to convey a teaching. Teaching that as the earth is impermanent, so is this body impermanent. The point of this teaching is to drive home the truth of impermanence and by implication the teaching on not self or emptiness. By making this point, the passage is based on two main ideas. One is similarity in nature. This body here is basically the same as Earth outside. But it is also based on this idea that the Earth is eventually going to be completely destroyed. And when the Earth is going to be completely destroyed, then this body will no longer be able to subsist. And this, I think, is particularly important for developing a perspective on ecological destruction, on climate change. It means that uh, the, it requires the clear recognition that for this human body to continue functioning and be alive, it requires the outside nature, the conditions outside in the world to be stable, sufficiently stable to allow that. This kind of teaching is on specific conditionality. And a specific conditionality is really the main implication of the early Buddhist teaching of dependent arising. Specific conditionality and its cessation. In fact, the key aspect of Paticca Samapada, of dependent arising, is the discerning the specific conditions responsible for dukkha and finding a way to step out of that. This is quite different from the idea of a general interdependence of phenomena, which has sometimes been used as an argument by some green Buddhists to promote environmental concerns. The problems from an early Buddhist perspective are two. One is that the teaching that everything is interdependent in this type of argument assumes a positive value. The idea is because I am interdependent with everything else, I should take care of it to, to maintain the state of interdependence in a harmonious condition. This is actually contrary to the teaching of dependent arising, which is not about maintaining conditions, but about stepping out of them. The second problem is that the idea of a general interdependence of phenomena doesn't really give me a possibility to evaluate them from an ethical perspective. If I am interdependent with trees, animals, flowers, etc., I'm also interdependent with nuclear based uh, industrial dirt, uh, destruction, whatever. I have no way for me to say that I prefer nature over natural destruction because I'm interdependent with both equally. This is why, from an early Buddhist perspective, the idea of interdependence is uh, not as convincing an argument for environmental concerns as is the idea that for this body to survive, I need the external environment to the appropriate living conditions. And a similar problem is also with the idea of Mother Earth. This is also sometimes being uh, an idea sometimes promoted in order to support environmental concerns. But um, it would not be possible to do this from an early Buddhist perspective where the Earth is never anthropomorphized, never turned into a, a being with intentionality and mentality and sentience. And uh, to consider the earth as a mother would also be problematic because once I see the provision of living conditions, food, etc., as the intentional act of mother earth, 
then I would also have to consider volcano eruptions, tsunamis, and earthquakes as intentional acts of that same earth. And that would, of course, not be quite what we would expect from a mother to or the destruction caused by these uh, activities. So it seems, again, from an early Buddhist perspective, to consider the earth as a mother is not really an avenue that we can take in order to establish environmental ethics. What really is the way, I think, to go forward here is to have this basic specific conditionality. The body needs living conditions. And this is what the next passage is about. So the passage uh, describes that now there's food available, but in the future there might be a famine, and then it will be difficult to practice. So there's this determination that let me practice now and get as far as possible in my practice so that I'm ready for when times get worse. This passage clearly confirms the dependency of the body on the external environment. And it also gives a kind of uh, meditative perspective on the climatic, climate change and environmental destruction we are expecting. That in some way, and this is a theme I'll be coming back to, it is also a call for practice. But the dependency of the human body on living conditions in order to have adequate amount of food, of course, also holds for animals. And here there is still another point in, on this whole topic of environmental ethics that I would just like to mention briefly. In the early discourses clearly recognize what we call the food chain, that animals eat each other. And they describe it like the big eat the small, the strong eat the weak. There's a lot of cruelty involved. However much we love animals and like nature, if we really observe, we see there's a lot of mutual killing going on. And the recognition of this food chain and its repercussions would also stand counter to uh, attributing sacredness to animals which is another argument sometimes used by Korean Buddhists. The problem is if I, let me say differently, from the usual connotation of what we say with sacred, we would not really be able to apply that to this mutual killing and eating each other of animals. If we do that by reinterpreting sacredness to include this type of cruelty, then we would no longer be able to use this term to judge human cruelty. So this whole idea of bringing in the sacredness of animals, plants, nature, is also not really compatible with the early Buddhist thought. Early Buddhism doesn't really give an intrinsic inherent value to nature, animals, or plants. And for that matter, also not to human beings. The real over-orientation is liberation, liberation from samsara. That is the one and central value or concern that all the teachings point to. And when I say that, I'm not doing this in an attempt to present this, what I'm saying here, as the only possible approach. I see my discussion as offering one of several alternatives. The situation is so complex and so broad, globally speaking, that we need different approaches. But my, my standpoint, my viewpoint here is I'm trying to formulate things from early Buddhist perspective. And from that perspective, we do the way to 
establish an environmental concern is based on the human need for appropriate living conditions. And even though this is an approach that gives priority to human beings, accords them a higher value than animals, it is an approach that at the same time calls for compassionate concern for those who are lower in the hierarchy for animals and plants. So it does not mean that giving importance to human beings implies necessarily exploitation and cruel treatment. Now let us look at the next passage on meditation in the earth. So this is from the Satipatthana Sutta and it describes uh, body contemplation, contemplating the body as made up of the four elements, earth, water, fire and wind. And there's also a simile that illustrates this kind of practice. The point made with this simile is that the butcher, when earlier he was seeing the whole cow, now that it is cut up into pieces, the butcher no longer thinks in terms of cow, but thinks in terms of pieces of meat that he puts out for sale. And so the basic thrust of this meditation practice is also to deconstruct the perception of ourselves as a solid self. It is about emptiness emptiness of yourself. And in that respect, the practice of these four elements is similar in thrust to the passage we looked at earlier, which was also about not-self. At that point, it was slightly different as it was brought about by the interrelationship between the internal and the external earth element and the realization of the ultimately impermanent nature. Here instead, it has this dissecting into four different aspects. And in the practice that I will be presenting for this first lecture, I will use the mindfulness practice, but I will follow the other approach, the approach of interrelating the internal and the external earth element and leaving aside the other three elements. And for that purpose, I employ a body scan a body scan itself is not found in early Buddhism and maybe this is also the time to be very clear that the meditation practices I present here, although they are inspired by my study of early Buddhist texts, come without any claim of being accurate reflections of meditation done in India 2,500 years ago. I should take all the blame or all the responsibility for what I'm presenting here. So what I will be presenting as a body scan for the earth element. But before coming to that, I would like to look at another passage that also relates to meditation. This is the third of the meditation practice on the earth element. So this is an instruction to basically have our mind similar to the element earth. And then we get an explanation of what that means. So what this passage is telling us is that the earth doesn't react to any of the dirt that is thrown on it. This, uh, of course, makes this passage quite relevant to pollution, the main problem that we are dealing with in this course, the whole question of ecological pollution. 
and it reconfirms also the point I made earlier about the earth not being considered a sentient beings, a sentient endowed with sentience. The whole point of this passage is precisely that the earth does not react and that we should basically learn to take this as an example for the cultivation of equanimity. So the three passages I've had on meditation, the elephant footprint brings up emptiness and equanimity. The mindfulness practice is on emptiness and this one on equanimity. We can see them converging on this cultivation of insight into emptiness and equanimity. And I think these are key qualities to develop our mental resilience in the face of the dukkha of climate change. And so the actual meditation practice that uh, uh, I would recommend, I would briefly describe it here, but I would uh, invite you to use the guided meditation, the audio instructions to follow, is first of all for us to experience the earth element through a body scan starting from the head and just slowly moving through the body, being aware of its solidity. And this scanning of the body doesn't have to come with the kind of feeling that I must absolutely experience solidity in every part of the body. We know it's solid. I mean, we can touch it, it's solid. So we know it's solid we don't have to prove it. As we don't have to prove it, we can simply scan, move our attention through the body and know it is solid. Even we don't distinctly experience it every time. The purpose is served by the scanning and knowing. And the scanning, this gradual scanning through the body is also meant to lead us into the meditation because sometimes we sit down and we're quite distracted and if we take up something very subtle and the mind just wanders off and we don't even notice. But if we use this gradual scanning, we give the mind something to do. And we also quickly notice when it goes off track, like going from the head to the neck to the shoulder and suddenly we're at the hip. We realize that something is missing and we realize it quickly. And so the body scan really has this purpose of helping us to gradually bring the mind into more settledness and equally important also to develop what I would like to call an embodied awareness. For me, in my approach to meditation, the way I teach this kind of somatic dimension is very important. Embodied presence, embodied mindfulness, embodied awareness. In fact, I will start all these meditation instructions by inviting you, first of all, to just come to the presence of the body to feel the whole body in the sitting posture and to have this sense of the whole body throughout at the background of the practice. So based on this scanning through the body in the sitting posture and the sensation of solidity as a manifestation of the internal earth element, then the next step comes by sensing the ground on which we sit, which is the external earth element. And from that sensing of the ground, then we can allow awareness to spread out in the different directions, knowing that, okay, I can sense right below me, but I know this solidity goes all the way out into the far, far distance, far away. And that direction and this direction and to the back and all around, and coming around there. And we get this sense of this earth spreading out in all directions almost as if there's the planet Earth and we are sitting on top of it. And then use the sense of gravity, become a, a way of the pull of gravity as something that really connects us with the Earth and allowing all our attentions always to just sink down into the ground and feel that connectedness with the element Earth. This is something actually very useful also in daily life, in any kind of situation where we have a challenge. If we can just for a moment connect to that sense of gravity, to go feet on the ground and feel grounded, and from there reply, respond to whatever is happening, it can be very useful. But from this 
meditation practice of sensing ourselves as part of the earth element. The next step then is to draw attention, bring to bear our awareness on the relationship of dependency, the specific conditionality that I discussed before. And it is really up to you to what degree you find explicit reflections helpful or not. Some reflection is useful, but we have to be very careful that it doesn't go into mental chattering, that we just keep talking to ourselves. So just find exactly the amount of reflection that helps to sharpen, and then just be with what results from that reflection. So the reflection goes somewhat along the lines that the body needs food, of course, the external earth element. But not only earth, it needs also beverages, the external water element. It needs protection from extremes of temperature, the fire element. And it needs wind element, in particular in the form of oxygen, breathing. And this oxygen that we breathe is actually being produced by the plants on the surface of the earth those on the land and also the plankton in the ocean. And so we are actually in a constant uh, process of exchange with all the life on the planet Earth around us. And we wouldn't be able to survive for very long without them. And this reflection, this, this, this understanding then can again become part of a more quiet and silent meditation practice by bringing mindfulness to be on the process of breathing. And here, my suggestion, which is somewhat different from the way this is usually approached, is not to focus on the breath. There's a very widespread tradition of Teaching mindfulness of breathing is something that you focus. You find a particular place, maybe here or here, and you focus on it at the exclusion of everything else. So the approach that I'm suggesting here is a little different. And if you're used to focusing, then I just invite you to see if what I present here works. If not, then you just continue with your practice. But what I'm suggesting is, first of all, it doesn't matter what physical sensation, what physical place you use, whether it's uh, above the upper lip or in the nostrils, at the back of the throat, the chest, rise and fall of the abdomen, or even no particular physical location, it doesn't matter. And whatever sensation we might experience, to allow this to be part of whole body awareness. In the understanding that the sensation is the finger that's pointing at the moon. We don't want to look at the finger, we want to look at the moon. Similarly, the sensation is simply what tells us about the breath moving in or out. What we want to know is the breath, the inhalation and exhalation taking place, and not so much the physical sensation. And as we become settled in this practice, then we have this whole body awareness, solidity connected to the ground with a sense of gravity, and within that experience, the breathing in, breathing out, with the understanding of the relationship of dependency, of, of the need for the outer environment to provide us with the oxygen for the continuity of the life of this body. And this much is what I think we would want to put into practice meditatively based on this first noble truth of Dukkha and what I presented.